السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. In the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى, the most gracious, most merciful. الحمد لله. All praise is indeed due to the Almighty, the Creator, the Nourisher, the Cherisher, the Sustainer, the Provider, the Protector, the Curer, the One in whose hands lies control of every aspect of existence and everything in existence. والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. We send blessings and salutations upon all the messengers that were sent from the beginning. The messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him, his companions, and all those who struggled and strove over the centuries in a way that the goodness has come to us. May the Almighty bless them and bless every one of us and grant every one of us goodness. My beloved brothers and sisters, if we were to look at the time when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had received revelation from the Almighty, we would come to realize that he was already chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was so concerned about the well-being of this community of his that we've just heard moments ago were involved in some of the worst crimes the most ugly scenarios that one would have seen were those from Makkah to Mukarrama in a period known as the period of ignorance and so he was an honorable man known as a Sadiq al Amin the most truthful the most honest how many of us are known as honest trustworthy and truthful that's a question I always ask myself if I want to be a follower of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him learn more about his seerah and the seerah here refers to his entire life I need to ask myself what have I learned from this it's not good enough to just have the facts of history many of us would know a lot about the history but we've never thought about putting it into our lives or we've never thought about where we fit in. So if he was known as honest, trustworthy, believe me, today we have a difficulty with being honest and trustworthy. Our own spouses no longer trust us. Why? Because we have a problem. Our family members don't trust us. Our communities don't trust us. When you see a Muslim businessman, people tell you, be careful. It should not be the case. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, prior to prophethood was already known as the trustworthy. It was something that the Almighty had kept so that the day he came to declare that none was to be worshipped besides the maker alone, they would not be able to accuse him of being a liar. He was never known as a liar. If he did not lie, if he did not lie about money matters and materialistic items of this world, why would he lie about that from the heavens? So one day as he was sitting and meditating, introspecting, thinking of what was going on, thinking of how solutions could be made possible for these people of Mecca who were his own people, Quraysh, etc. Something happened. Something huge happened. It was not the first time he went up into the mount, into the cave of Hira. He had been there many times. And he used to worry and have a concern about the evil that was taking place. I pause again. How many of us are concerned about the evil that is taking place? Or are we a part of that evil? That's a good question. Sometimes we are part of the problem. We need to ask ourselves, here is a man, the best of creation, the most noble of all messengers of the Almighty. And even prior to prophethood, he was already concerned about the solutions to the problems that were being faced by the people. I think it should encourage myself and yourselves to think about solutions to problems that people are facing. No matter what those problems are, you need to introspect, you need to think, you need to discuss, you need to talk, you need to have a set of friends who are brilliant people because Muhammad, peace be upon him, had beautiful friends even prior to prophethood. He had a people like Abu Bakr as siddiq who was also known as a person who never ever 
indulged in that which was intoxicating. And that's just one example. He was also truthful. He was also an upright business person. He was young, subhanallah. How many of us would be proud of the type of people we mix with, we interact with? Sometimes we interact with people simply because they're wealthy, but they have nothing besides the wealth. Sometimes we interact with people simply because they're good looking. They have nothing besides looks. We need to ask ourselves when the Almighty's blessed us, would we be the best of friends for others? And I know some people ask me sometimes, they say, well, you know what? I don't know if I'm in good company, if I'm in bad company or if they're in good company. Say, for example, I'm trying to lead a good life. I'm trying to be honest. I'm trying to be trustworthy. And honesty begins with honesty towards your maker by worshiping him alone. And then people say, well, all these others who want to be my friends, sometimes they may have qualities, habits that are not that grand. So am I in bad company or are they in good company? Simple answer is you have to look at who is impacting upon whom. If their bad qualities are being eradicated bit by bit, then they are in good company. And if your good qualities and good habits are being eradicated bit by bit, then you're in bad company. As simple as that. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had, a such, had such a powerful impact upon people that when he did some work for a lady, for a woman known as Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha, at that time she was not a Muslim, Islam had not yet come about in that region and she was so impressed by his honesty, by his uprightness, by his skills of business. Subhanallah, imagine being employed by a woman, mashallah, tabarakallah. I think when people look at us as Muslimin and some strict Muslims don't even realize that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, was actually working for a female at a certain stage, subhanallah. It's got to do with how you deal with the opposite sex. It needs to be respectful. It needs to be polite. It needs to be good. It needs to be based on that which is upright. And that's exactly what it was. So she decided to do something very, very unique. What was it? According to the bulk of narrations, she was 40 years old at the time. And he was just 25. Imagine 15 years younger than her. And she tried something. What was it? She sent out a, what we would term proposal somehow, that she wanted to marry this man. Wow. People say, Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive us. People say, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a womanizer. A'udhu Billah. I will prove to you within the next two days that that is the furthest from the truth. Here he is, 25 years old, at the peak of his, of his youth, basically, just out of his teens into the 20s. And there is a woman, 40 years old, and she is saying, I'd like to marry this man. Thought about it, and guess what? He agreed. He agreed, he married her. She was the only spouse he had until she passed away. Subhanallah. Now I want to take you right up to the prophethood itself when he was seated in this cave and each one of us should be introspecting our own condition every day you need to have spent the day better than the previous day in every aspect of spending the day better than the previous day and every day you need to think about how tomorrow can be better than that particular day then you're a true believer but if your days are equal you can do much better you can do much more to improve yourself in the same way when we have a business or when we have a salary, we would not like to see that salary remain the same. We want to see an improvement. We don't want to see our business go down or be the same. We want to see it go up. We should also want to see our relationship with our maker improve and not go backwards. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as he is in this cave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the archangel Jibreel, Gabriel, may peace be on him. Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and instructs him with an instruction. Iqra. Now it was the plan of the Almighty that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was unlettered. Unlettered meaning he didn't recognize the letters, he didn't read or write. 
That doesn't mean he was not educated. He was the most highly educated. Didn't I tell you moments ago that he was a successful businessman, one of the best? Subhanallah. Today, people would probably study for 30, 40 years and keep on studying. And still, they might not have even the slightest of understanding in certain topics. But the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he had knowledge of absolutely everything after nubuwa everything was given to him by allah after prophethood prior to prophethood allah had blessed him in so many ways here he is sallallahu alaihi wasallam listening to this angel that had come to him saying iqra read and he says ma ana biqari ma ana biqari he was not proud to admit that I am not a Qari, I'm not a reader. So the revelation comes again, read. And he says it for the second time, I'm not a reader. Where is the setting? It is in Mecca, the cave of Hira. The Prophet ﷺ is receiving the first of revelation. He's told to read twice. And twice he replies, I'm not a reader. The third time he's told to read and the verses are revealed and these verses are so powerful. Jibreel alayhi salam actually embraces him so tight that he felt that he was being choked. Read in the name of your Lord who has created. I want to pause there for a moment before I continue about prophethood. My brothers, my sisters, nothing is impossible for the Almighty. In the name of your Lord, everything is possible. Don't underestimate the power of your maker. No matter what you're going through in life, no matter what you would like to achieve, seek the help of your maker. In the name of your Lord. And at the same time, the capacity that that maker has given you, utilize it to try to achieve what you want. I promise you the Almighty will open your doors if it is written for you. Don't give up hope in the mercy of the Almighty. Here is a man being honest, saying, I'm not a reader. And the Almighty is telling him through revelation, by the name of your Lord. If you take the name of your Lord, you will go beyond the readers, those who read. What is there in reading and writing if you have not benefited from it? What is there in being computer literate if you're only using it for pornography and if you're only using it for harm, for robbery, for cheating, for deceiving, for stealing, etc., for spying? What was the point of becoming computer literate? I'd rather be one who does not know much, but who is honest, trustworthy, developed character, conduct. I might have learned through different means. The same would apply to our mobile gadgets. Many of us are interested in the latest, subhanallah. We're interested in that which is such that if we had something today and tomorrow morning the same company came, a, came up with one notch higher, our hearts would sink, subhanallah. I know of people who have the absolute latest and they even show it to you. Here's the latest. Moments later, when there is one notch higher, they are depressed. Depressed to the degree that, you know what, I need that one. Fair enough, you want the latest, but have you benefited from it? What do you do with your gadgets? What do you do with what Allah's blessed you with? I wouldn't mind the older people who don't even know how to use a phone, but they are such a pleasure to speak with. How many of us speak to our family members and we can put our phones aside? Look at the lessons we are drawing. And the reason why we have to do this is technology has advanced. And in the same way, they might have gone through something in their times. They did not compromise what was right. They didn't. They made sure that they did it. I want to encourage all my brothers and sisters, whether you're a child, a father, a mother, a spouse, whoever you are, however you fit into your family, put aside your devices when it comes to the meals. Prohibit them on the table. Get together and eat at least once a day together as a family. It is more valuable than you can imagine. You have a family. That family was blessed or you were blessed 
by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by being given them, ask those who don't have that. And yet, whole day we're on our phones, we come to the table, we're eating one hand, the phone, the other hand. I've seen young people mastering the art of operating a mobile device with one hand, subhanallah, one hand. And the thumb is moving like you don't even know, even without looking at it. They're typing, they're doing things, mashallah, tabarakallah. It's about time we put limits and we knew where and when to use that phone and how much to operate it. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is given revelation. And like I said, he's being honest. It's not easy to say, I know nothing about this phone today when we're in the age of technology and you know these mobile devices are becoming so sophisticated that i was told recently that a time will come when the radiological departments of a lot of hospitals will be redundant because you'd be able to do your scans and everything else with your mobile device imagine the scan you put it onto your your belly and a little while later you can tell oh wow it's a boy can you see subhanallah wow I'm not trying to undermine those who are radiologists, but I'm telling you what the reality is. Subhanallah. Life has changed. You remember something called post offices before? We used to write letters. Now it's called snail mail. And you know what? If they didn't update, they became redundant completely. They had to start doing different things. So here is the Prophet, peace be upon him. He's just achieved revelation. And the first words came down, the first verses came down, and he was at the top of the mount. And at the same time, because of him being hugged so tight, embraced, so to speak, he rushed down that mountain. Where did he go? He wanted to relate this most important event in his life to someone. He wanted to relate it to someone. Who do I go to? Think about it. Every one of us here, if you had something extremely important that just happened to you, who would you relate it to? Who would be the first person you thought of? Where would you go? Many of us, we would not go to our spouses. They would be the last people to know. The world has changed, right? And if we did go to our spouses, they'd probably say, you deserve it. Yeah. You know, didn't they scare you to death or something? That's what we would say. Subhanallah. That's how we have actually degraded ourselves. Whereas, if we were true followers of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we would learn something from the fact that as he ran down, the first person he embraced was this wife of his, 15 years older, senior. He had all his children from her besides one. All of them were from her. Subhanallah. And he comes down, he says, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, you know, Give me that hug. I need a tight hug. Subhanallah. I've just translated it into our language, right? How many of us, when we feel that we need some form of reassurance, we would go to our spouse and say, give me that hug. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. I don't want to actually harp on how we have become, but I'm sure each one of us knows we have a lot of work to do. How close are you to your spouse? Make an effort. Many men and even women try to impress those whom they're not even related to and their own spouses are looking out for any form of attention and it's not coming. Subhanallah. And we call ourselves Muslim. We call ourselves followers of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. What an insult we are sometimes. You have to work hard on your relations. You have to work very, very hard if you would like to truly be a follower of Muhammad. Peace be upon him. So he comes to Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. He embraces her. He relates what happened. You know what she says? She knows the man is such a brilliant man. He's honest. He's trustworthy. He helps people. He fulfills his, his duty more than the duty. He looks after the widows and the orphans. She says, Kalla wallahi la Allahu abadan. Nay, never. Impossible. Allah will never ever let you down. Do you know why? You are such a good man. Many men out here tonight, can your spouses say you're such a good man? Wow. Would they say you're such a good man? And if they did, 
I think it would not be unless you were present there saying, yeah, talk about me. Yeah, let's hear what you've got to say. Very good man, really excellent, lovely person, etc. Why? Because you're standing there. Would your spouse be able to say you're a good man in your absence? If that is the case, the same messenger tells us, Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlihi wa ana khayrukum li ahli. The best from amongst you are those who are best to their wives. The term ahl starts off with wife and then it goes on to your family members. So if you are the best to your family members, you are said to be the best of all of us. And then he caps that by saying, and I am the best from all of you to my family. Wow. That's what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. You see this beginning of Nubuwa, the wife says, Allah will never let you down because you're a good man. You fulfill all of the good things. You look after widows and orphans. You look after the neighbors. You reach out to your family, etc., etc. You you don't do any evil. How can Allah let you down? And she took him to Waraka bin Nawfal, who was a cousin of hers. And what did he say? He was a man who had knowledge of the scriptures. And he says, after asking questions, he says a few things. I will mention one or two of them. He said, that is the same angel that came to the prophets before you, like Jesus and Moses, etc. And now the angel has come to you. And I wish I was there the day you will be sent and instructed to give that message and convey it. Okay. And then he says, a day will come when your people will drive you out, when your people will drive you out of your city. And he was surprised. He says, how and why will they drive me out of my city? But he made mention of the fact that whenever you have come and been chosen by the Almighty for something, there has to be persecution because that is your test. Are you truthful? Are you not? Allah says, do people think it will be enough for them to say that we're believers and then they're not tested? And Allah says how he has tested all those before in order to distinguish the truthful from amongst those who are not. Wow. In order to distinguish the truthful from those who are not truthful, those who are liars. So this man being chosen by Allah and he's being told you are going to be persecuted, but he was loved by his people prior to that. How many of us, when we choose to do the right thing, we are not prepared to take a little bit of flack. We'll give it up. Nowadays, we'd rather give up what is just and right in order not to be stressed with what people have to say about us. I just need to fit in. I remember a young relative of mine telling me that I am inspired by being, you know, appropriately dressed and being upright. But all my friends and my family members, etc., meaning the others, young, my age, they are so, so into the latest in terms of fashion and design and they don't mind compromising what is right and wrong in order for them to fit in with the latest trends and i said you know what you need to remain steadfast upon what the almighty has placed in your heart and you will be a leader i promise you years passed and this young relative of mine became a leader became someone who's considered a role model amongst the same circle of friends had she given up what she considered correct because of what they were all saying everyone would have lost this is why when the almighty has blessed you with guidance with goodness with morality with uprightness when he's placed in your heart the flicker of that iman the faith and the conviction don't give it up smile 
be the best behaved person, be polite, be absolutely brilliant in your character and conduct, but be upright at the same time. No need to give up what is right just because you want to fit in. The Prophet ﷺ was told you're going to be driven out. Anyway, now let's move ahead. If you look at Mecca at that time, they loved the Prophet. They had a problem in the period of ignorance with the black stone and with Hilful Fudul, where there was a, a businessman who had come from outside who was cheated by the people. And they all got together in order to promise that they will fulfill the rights of those who come from afar when they come in for some reason and they will stand up for justice. They had involved Muhammad peace be upon him in solving those matters, even though he was young. But now when he called the people up later on Mount Safa, he called his family members come along. He called the others come along part of the, the tribesmen come along. And then he says, my beloved tribesmen, this is the Mount Safa. If I were to tell you that there is an enemy on the other side of the mountain, the reason why he said that is because they were down. They couldn't see the other side, but he was on the top. He could see the other side. If I were to tell you there is an enemy behind here, would you believe me? They said, indeed we would, because obviously you're a truthful man. He says, well, I want to tell you that there is a day of reckoning that is coming. He says, I am a warner to you about a punishment that will be coming if we continue in this way. There needs to be change. We need to worship the Almighty alone and stop every form of zulm, every form of oppression and that which is wrong. They looked at him from amongst them were the wealthy, the cronies, the others, everyone else. And they said, is this what you have gathered us here for? Ali Hada Jama'atana, one of his uncles whose name was Abu Lahab, he gets up and he says, Tabbalaka ya Muhammad, destruction be upon you, O Muhammad. Is this why you gathered us here? To tell us this, whatever you're calling us towards? And you know what? They refuse to listen. Now I pause for another moment. My brothers, my sisters, when we are going wrong in our lives, how many of us would thank a person who corrects us? How many of us would thank people who tell us what's right and wrong? My brother, you're going wrong. My sister, I don't think you should do this. My brother, improve your attitude. The way you are speaking to the people who work for you is unacceptable. And they would say, you're telling me, who do you think you are? It's not that improve yourself. Are you not a follower of this blessed prophet Muhammad? Peace be upon him. Well, if you are, then correct yourself, humble yourself, no matter who you are, accept correction. I can take you back to the story of Abraham, the prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. As young as he was, he was correcting his father and the father was too arrogant. He says, who are you? I will throw you into the fire. Look at the warnings just because he did not want to take advice from his young son. How many of us, when our children tell us, mom, you're going wrong, dad, what you've done is wrong. We say, shut up, astaghfirullah, a word that doesn't even sound from my mouth, anything positive, mashallah. It doesn't sound good. Keep quiet, get lost, etc. We say that to our own kids. When they have a point, you just swore huge swear words, and your son is saying, hey, your daughter's telling you, hey, please don't do that. And you say, who are you? Why? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. These people refused to listen to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But the flicker of Iman was in the hearts of a few. Those who knew the Prophet, peace be upon him. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. What a great companion of the Prophet. A cousin of the Prophet. A young boy at the time. He accepted the deen. I want to show you something very interesting. The close circle of this man, Muhammad, peace be upon him, immediately believed that what he is saying is the truth because he's never lied. Who was the first one? Khadija, the same lady, Khuwailid radiallahu anha, the mother of the believers. May Allah bless her. She accepted immediately. I know my husband. I know him very well. He's an honest man. If he says it's blue, it's blue. If he says it's green, it's green. He's not going to lie. With us, those closest to us actually know how bad we are. That's how it is. 
Let's change that. Come on. Change it today. By the will of Allah. Make it in your, within your resolution for tonight. That I'm going to change the way people look at me for the sake of Allah. They must look at me and say, honest person, upright, lovely, dedicated, far from sin and evil. A family man, a good man, etc. A lovely lady concentrating on what benefits rather than what is harmful, etc. So the next Ali ibn Abi Talib, anh, he was young. He was brought up by the Prophet, peace be upon him. He lived with him for a time. He says, I believe, yes, you're a messenger of Allah. I believe there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And I believe that you're the messenger. Indeed, who was then next from among the men? The first was Abu Bakr, a Siddiq radiallahu anhu. What a great man. His name was actually Abdullah ibn Uthman. That was the name of Abu Bakr. But his kunia was Abu Bakr. And his father was known as Abu Quhafa. So Abu Bakr ibn Abi Quhafa, but his real name was Abdullah ibn Uthman. This man Abdullah was the friend of the Prophet peace be upon him for years when he came up with prophethood immediately Abdullah ibn Uthman accepted it immediately. If you're saying this correct, I'm with you. And he went to his own friends. He says, you know, Muhammad peace be upon him is a messenger of Allah. And he started convincing them one after the other. And they came through, you know, the 10 who are given glad tidings of paradise at the time of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. A lot of them were actually introduced to Islam by Abu Bakr as Siddiq. They were part of the same clique. They were part of the same friendship. How many of us, when we do something upright, we phone our friends. Listen, there's a good deed to be done. We'd like you to contribute. And let's come through the 10 of us. I'm sure we can handle this. We'll manage it on our own. A good deed. If that's the case, well done. Your friendship will come to fruit, inshallah. Not only in this world, but even in the hereafter. But if that friendship is only when you're going to hang out doing the wrong things, and I don't want to mention the wrong because it's so much, then what's the benefit of the friendship? Let that friendship be of benefit as well. Let it be of goodness, not just evil. This is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. His best friends were the ones who were closest to him even after he received this beautiful prophethood. Thereafter comes the period of persecutions. So now there was a bit of a shock around Mecca. There is a man challenging everyone. He wants to change the religion of our forefathers. Who is he? He is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. They said, but he was a good man. He was a really good man. You know, when Salih alayhi salam came up with the message to the people, they said, Ya Salih, qad kunta qabla hadha. O Salih, before you came up to us telling us to worship God Almighty alone, we had a lot of hope in you. You were a good guy. We knew or we thought you were going to be one of the successful of our community. And then you came up with revelation and you lost the plot. Astaghfirullah. That's what they told Salih. Similar, they told Muhammad, peace be upon him. What are you coming? What do you want? Are you after money? Are you after women? Are you after power, authority? And the, the same questions are asked today. When people do something nice, sometimes they're after something. It's only those who believe that have sincerity, they're doing it for the Almighty. I always tell people, when I am taught to do good as a Muslim, I am taught to do good to those who deserve goodness, but more than that, to those who don't even deserve it. I don't do good to people because they've done good to me alone. But I do good to people even if they've not done good to me. And even if they've done bad to me. Simply because the Almighty loves those who do good. And I want to be from amongst them. Haven't we heard in Revelation. Wallahu yuhibbul muhsinin. Inna Allah yuhibbul muhsinin. Allah loves those who do good. Indeed, definitely Allah loves those who do good. So do good because Allah loves those who do good. You don't have to do good tit for tat. They did good, I do good. I do good because they deserve good. No, a winner is he or she who can do good to those who do bad. Wow. This is Muhammad. This is his message. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They began persecutions one after the other. We know the story of Bilal ibn Rabah. How they had to... Astaghfirullah. What they did to him. 
I don't even want to go through all of that in the sun, the heat of the desert. And they dragged him with rocks in order to persecute him, punish him. You want to follow that man? We're going to punish you. He didn't give up. Ahadun Ahad. Ahadun Ahad. He continued saying, I believe in the one God, my maker, no one else. I'm not going to worship anything and anyone else. You worship your maker alone. That is what Islam says. Whoever created me is the only one who deserves that my head go, goes on the ground five times a day for him and him alone. No one else. The beauty was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not calling towards himself. He was calling towards Allah. To this day, when you hear scholars, when you hear preachers, when you hear people who are calling you towards religion, if they are calling you towards themselves, they are at a loss. They are wrong. But if they are calling you towards the Almighty and getting closer to your maker, then they are indeed giving you a message. They are messengers of the messenger. They are doing the right thing. So don't be fooled by one who is calling you towards himself because he wants to be popular and famous, but rather one who is calling you to worship Allah and Allah alone. That was the message of Muhammad, peace be upon him. When they persecuted Bilal uh, ibn Rabah, radiallahu an, he didn't give up. Whoever they persecuted at the time, they did not give up. Today, mashallah, today, we have a minimum of two shahada. People have already declared their faith by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, here tonight. And I want to tell you something interesting about it. When people enter the fold of Islam today, I pray for them more than ever before because this is a time on the globe where it is not easy to be a Muslim. But they're coming into Islam. And I have seen people who are born Muslim who do not value that religion. And Allah says it clearly. If you are going to turn away, we will replace you with others who are not going to turn away the way you did. When you see people who were born Muslim turn away from the goodness of that religion, I have been to the rural areas of Africa where I've seen people more keen on Islam than any, anywhere else on the globe. I've been to parts of northern Nigeria and we know that when you hear Nigeria, people quickly hold their pockets, right? It's unfortunate because that is wrong. It might just be a small group of people. But in actual fact, if you knew the people from the north and the people from a lot of the poorer nations, they're actually more connected to the Almighty than a lot of us, myself included. I've been brought to tears when I've seen how they learn the Quran without even having a mushaf. They learn on parchments. They write it on slates and on pieces of wood to this day. And we are sitting here giving up our faith slowly but surely. Giving it up to what? The pressure of what? Materialism, modernization, everything else. You can be as modern as you want. You can have the most sophisticated living ever. But don't give up your connection with Allah. You can have the best car, the most luxury of homes. You can have millions in your bank account that does not make you a person who is into the dunya, but it just is your test. Is all of that going to bring you closer to Allah or is it going to take you away from Allah? If it takes you away from your maker, you have lost. And if it takes you closer to your maker, you have won. So Muhammad, peace be upon him. Persecutions began. They did not give up. How many of us, because of what people think of us, we give up? We'll give up our hijab, we'll give up our salah, we'll give up our what is right and wrong. We won't read salah, we won't even read the Quran, we won't want to be seen with anything. Even our name, you have a beautiful name. Instead of saying it, you've just chosen a small little, you know, nickname and you like to give it because you don't even want to come across as a Muslim. I remember once I was in Switzerland and we were at the airport. And there was no room to read Salah. And my father was with me. 
and we decided to read Salah in one corner. And I felt a little bit uneasy, but I knew this had to happen for the sake of Allah because I wanted to look for a prayer room, but I didn't find it and the time was running out. So I decided, you know what? We decided that we're going to read Salah here and we have to read Qasr anyway, you know, a shortened Salah and we will go. So Allahu Akbar and we quickly started and commenced. You'll be surprised. People started watching and people gathered and people actually asked us questions when we were done. What just happened there, etc. And it was such an opportunity. I saw an elderly Caucasian lady who stopped and she said that was the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. And I said, Astaghfirullah to myself. I said, Oh Allah, forgive me. A moment ago, I thought that I shouldn't be doing this. And look at these people. You have shown them the way we worship in a way that was unique, subhanallah. And I wouldn't be surprised if later on, one or two of them might have shown a deeper interest in Islam. My aim and idea is not to convert people. No, that is in the hands of the Almighty. But they have to know at least that we are good human beings. We spread goodness and peace. And we want to develop our character and conduct. We will be kind to Muslim, non-Muslim, to humankind and beyond, even to the other creatures of the Almighty. We believe that people have entered paradise because they were kind to an animal like a dog. Wow. What do you think being kind to another human being is going to get to you? Is going to get you too if that thing got someone to paradise? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. So, my brothers and sisters, with without being persecuted, we're ready to give up our faith. Those with proper persecution, some of them were executed as well. They did not give up their faith. They didn't. They kept it. What a lesson we learn. Brothers and sisters, don't give up what you stand for. Don't give up your faith in the face of whatever challenges you may have. You don't give up your maker. Yes, it's beautiful. It's lovely. We have a gift of the Almighty. The problem is, it's only those who understand that this is a gift who would be able to preserve it. Imagine, imagine being given a stone and being told, you know what? Go and sell this. And you don't know it's a diamond. And you take it to a butcher. The butcher will say, yeah, I don't need this. Right? Take it away. You take it then to a carpenter. He'll probably say, you know what? If you want me to dispose of the stone, pay me and then I'll take it for you. <laughs> it's only when you take it to the jeweler. And he sees that this is 10 million rial, for example. He will close his whole store, you know, and bring you in and welcome you and offer you tea and drinks and everything else and give you some perfume and tell you, can I make an offer? Wow. And if you say no, he will say, listen, word of advice, don't walk out on the street alone. You need a few bodyguards. Wow. Because he's the only guy who has recognized that what you have is something worth millions. The problem with us, we are just like those butchers and carpenters who don't know much about diamonds. Learn to understand that what you have is more valuable than any diamond. It's the deen. It's the religion. It's the following of Muhammad, peace be upon him. But you need to learn because we don't want those who have a warped understanding of the faith to overtake our understanding of it and to make us people who begin to hate more than we love. It's a religion of love. It's a religion of peace. It's a religion of tolerance. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us how to spread the word because he spread it in the most beautiful way. He was so tolerant in the Meccan period of people who harmed him such that after a time they had to declare, wow, this man is indeed something else. He's a messenger. So many such stories. Let me take you to something very interesting. And obviously I'm not able to cover every aspect of this Meccan period, but I'm going to take you through some of the aspects and draw lessons for us in our own lives. We spoke about persecution. We spoke about how the prophet peace be upon him and his companions were persecuted, but they didn't give up. They did not give up. Imagine giving up your goodness stops the day you give up. But there was something beyond mere persecution. There was a boycott that boycott 
entire Banu Hashim was boycotted by Quraysh. Their own people boycotted them. What must happen? No food, no drink, no one comes, no one goes. Why? Just because we're right. That's why. It happened for three whole years from the seventh year of prophethood all the way down to the tenth year. They didn't have food. They didn't have drink. The companions say that, you know what? We ate the leaves of the trees, but we didn't give up our faith. We were determined that, you know what? We're going to come out of this much stronger than we went into it. They prayed to Allah, not for one day. These were the companions of the most blessed, the most loved unto Allah. Here is a prophet we believe he's the most loved unto the Almighty. Why is he going through such persecution for years on end? And they're praying and praying and calling out to Allah. And they're not seeing the result of it in front of them. But they knew that when the time is right, it's going to happen. And when it happens, we will emerge the most victorious. So... If you open the books of the seerah, you will find that there was a parchment, an agreement that Quraysh had made with one another in order to boycott the Muslims in a place known as Shi'ab Abi Talib. And they hung that in the Kaaba, the most sacred house in existence. A day came when ants had actually eaten up that whole parchment. When they went, they saw the parchment is eaten. That's the day the boycott ended, three years later. Three years later, they emerged from there victorious. There is a lesson for that or from that for every one of us. When people treat you in such a way, you can only emerge victorious. You, can, you need to be patient. We call out to the Almighty one day, two days, five days, one year, and we say, I called out to Allah, He's not answering me, and you know, now I'm just going to be an atheist. There was a brother three days ago sent me an email. He said, you know, I'm suffering with this disease. May Allah give him cure. Say Amin. And may Allah grant cure to all those who are sick and ill from amongst us and from the Ummah and humanity at large. Say Amin. So my brothers and sisters, this guy comes, sends me an email saying, you know what? I'm suffering this disease. I've been calling out to the Almighty for a long time. I've been a good person. Now I'm considering being an atheist because Allah is not coming to my health. How long? Not even a year. I replied saying, my brother, I know of atheists who have diseases bigger than yours. And they're turning to Allah. Subhanallah. Look at that. Subhanallah. It's a test of the Almighty. Don't lose faith. Keep it going. We call out to Allah one day, two days, then we give up. We call out for five days, ten days, one year, two years, we give up. Keep calling out when the day is right, the time is right. What you want will be given to you on a golden platter by the will of Allah. Do you believe? Yes. Well, then keep on going. Keep on praying. Keep on trying. If it's not coming, perhaps the Almighty knows that it's not the right time or it might not be the right thing. But my brothers and sisters, take a look. At the three years they were praying, they kept on praying. They asked Allah, they suffered, no food, no drink. They ate the leaves. They started licking or chewing on the hides of the animals, the hides. The skin of the animals. They didn't complain. No one told Muhammad, peace be upon him, you know what? We're with you and we're losing. So now we're going away. Nobody. They took it. What's the lesson? Keep praying. Keep having hope in the mercy of Allah. Don't give up. Thereafter, the Prophet ﷺ suffered in the 10th year, Am al Huzn. They came out of what? This Hisar. They came out of the boycott three years later and he lost his most beloved. Who was that? His wife. His wife Khadija binti Khuwailid radiallahu anha, the support, the pillar, the one who gave him every form of support he needed at the time. The one who gave him his children besides one. Ibrahim was from Maria al qibtiya radiallahu anha. He was sad. One thing happened, persecutions. Another thing happened, the boycotts. A third thing happened, I just lost my wife. A fourth thing happened, I lost my uncle, who was a pillar of support as well, Abu Talib. I lost him. It was a sad year. Abu Talib had not accepted Islam, but 
he was a pillar of strength. He didn't allow, he did not allow the people of Mecca to harm his nephew. Not at all. Hijrah did not take place until after the death of Abu Talib. When he was there, he was standing as a leader of Quraysh. He would not allow anyone to take the name of his nephew in a negative way. But he passed away. Why? Why would Allah do this to the most beloved? Because life is a test. And Allah wants every one of us to know that in your life, you'll have one thing negative, two things negative, three things negative, four things negative. Do not come and say, someone's done black magic on me. It's not always the case with us. Yes, I do acknowledge that there is a rise in that. I do acknowledge that people are doing certain things that they're not supposed to do. I do acknowledge that it does exist. But 99 times out of 100, the difficulties we have are not connected to superstition at all. Everyone's going through problem. People say, I have financial difficulty. Tell me who doesn't. I met a wealthy man three weeks ago, very wealthy. He told me business is no longer as it was. I said, just thank Allah. Thank Allah. That's it. It doesn't mean anything has happened or hasn't happened in terms of superstition. Here is the prophet peace be upon him. He lost his wife. He was sad. He lost his uncle. He was sad. He decided, you know what? I need to spread this message of Allah. Let me go further. Moments ago, we heard Umar Isa deliver a beautiful song about the incident of Ta'if. What happened in Ta'if? The Prophet, peace be upon him, decided, let me go to Ta'if. If the people of Mecca are not listening, perhaps the people of Ta'if might hear. It was worse when he went to Taif, they didn't just reject. No, they rejected together with throwing stones and chasing and making the most blessed droplets of blood ever to exist. Actually, subhanallah, bleed. And thereafter, the angels come and say, if you ask us to crush them, they will be crushed. If you ask us to bring the two mountains together, they will be brought together. What would you do? A guy from down the road who's been disturbing you with his motor vehicle and a big noise every night when you're trying to sleep. Imagine for a moment an angel came to you and said, we can crush him. You say, crush him and his father. <laughs> That's, that's how far we've gone from the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. May Allah forgive us. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, he told the angels, No, if Allah hasn't guided them, perhaps he will guide their offspring. Have hope. Look at the hope he has. He has hope that the next generation, and Allah showed him already, it wasn't even the next generation. Those guys themselves sometime later accepted Islam, a lot of them. Today go to Ta'if, Muslimin, mashallah. Hope. A lot of us don't have that determination, that hope. On top of that, he raises his hands in order to pray. I can just imagine, I picture it all the time. You know, the angels are listening to the dua when you make a dua. And I can imagine the Prophet, peace be upon him, the most blessed to tread this earth, and the most loved by the Almighty. And he says, Oh Allah. And imagine everyone's listening now. All the angels are listening. He says, Allahumma, oh Allah, inni, I, inni, ashku ilayka, I'm complaining to you. I can just imagine, I'm just imagining myself that the angels are listening to this complaint of the Prophet. Who are you complaining about? What are you complaining about? We will deal with it here and now. But guess what he complained about? Inni ashku ilayka wa qillata hilati. Oh Allah, I'm complaining to you about myself. I'm weak. Look, I'm so weak. I've come to Taif and these people are not even listening to what I have to say. Subhanallah. I'm complaining about myself, not about everyone else. Many of us, when we have a problem, we blame everyone else, but we never blame ourselves. We don't even want to look at whether we are part of the problem. Like I said at the beginning of this talk. Subhanallah. So the Almighty is teaching us through the lessons that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, left for us. 
but we call ourselves the Muslims. We call ourselves people close to the Prophet, but we're far away from this beautiful life that he led, even with hardship. If you think you have hardship, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had greater hardship, but he was thankful. His companions had greater hardship, but they were thankful. And trust me, I want to prove to you that a day will come when the Almighty will shower some blessings in the midst of those hardships. Life is a struggle, but now and again you go on a holiday, you enjoyed it, right? Life is a struggle, but now and again you have a good day, a happy day, a lovely occasion, a memory, subhanallah. Life is a struggle, but now and again you might have a child you're blessed with. May Allah grant us all good families. You might be blessed with something great. You might have a bonus somewhere. You might have found a good job. Something happens. So these good things are intertwined in those things that seem negative to us. I want to tell you something that was powerful that Allah blessed the Prophet peace be upon him with. I already spoke to you about persecutions, spoke to you about the boycott, spoke to you about the loss of his wife spoke to you about the loss of his uncle spoke to you about Ta'if. it was known as Amul Huzun, the year of sadness for who for the most beloved unto Allah. And then Allah says, we want to give you a gift. Do you know what was the gift of Allah? Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa. Allah Almighty took the messenger, peace be upon him, in body and soul miraculously from Mecca to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem all the way up to the seven heavens. And he saw Jannah, Jahannam. He met with Allah according to some narrations. And he saw and met with all the messengers in these heavens, one after the other. And he came down back to his bedding in a short space of time. And that is known as the Isra and the Mi'raj. Allah blessed him with such a great gift. And we believe it happened. You know, today, or was it last night, I was talking to someone about Isra and Mi'raj. And he was telling me, do you know, scientific evidence now proves through the black holes, etc., that this is actually very, very possible. Very possible. It can happen. So I said, well, we believe it definitely did happen. Miracle. It's Allah. Allah can take you up to the heavens and bring you back. Don't we believe that Jesus, may peace be upon him, is alive? Don't we believe that he is with Allah? Don't we believe that he is coming back? Don't we believe that he, he never died? He actually was taken up by the Almighty, living alive? Don't we believe that? How? It's a miracle. It's Allah. Allah created. Allah does anything. So look at how Allah took him. Allah showed him Jannah. Allah showed him Jahannam. Allah gave him the gift of prayer. And subhanallah, he came back down and the people started saying things. This is impossible. How could it have happened? They went back to this man, Abdullah ibn Uthman. Do you remember who is Abdullah ibn Uthman? Anyone? Can you say it loudly? Mashallah. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. His name was Abdullah ibn Uthman. An. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had come down. The kuffar of Quraysh started telling the people, do you believe this? They asked Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, obviously he knew that this is impossible for it to happen to any human. But when he was told, your friend is claiming this, he said, if my friend is claiming this, then I believe that it definitely happened. He became known as as siddiq from that day on. Amazing. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's the last point I want to mention for today before we inshallah will continue tomorrow by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that point is my brothers, my sisters, you will go through hardship. You will go through difficulty in your lives, but the Almighty will bless you with a lot of goodness. He will show you miracles in your own personal private lives. He will bless you in a million ways. He will give you offspring. He will give you offspring who will make you happy. He will give you, even if you don't have offspring, He will give you something else. 
He will give you a lot. I, people are looking for spouses. The Almighty, may He bless you with spouses who will be the coolness of your eyes. I didn't hear a loud Amin there. MashaAllah, that was now very loud. <laughs> I wonder what all the married men were saying Amin for. MashaAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May Allah grant you goodness. And when we have offspring, subhanAllah, it brings the coolness of our eyes, especially when we see them grow. Excitement, subhanAllah, they go to school. You know, my friend Ghazil Manna'i, he was so excited to inform me about his daughter having graduated Al Anud, mashallah. And when he told us, I could see the love in his eyes. I could see, subhanAllah, and I'm telling myself, these are the gifts of Allah that we need to appreciate. All our children, we congratulate them. We are happy upon their graduation, upon their happiness. But I want to tell you the reality. The day we graduate with Jannah, that is the day we will truly be happy. May the Almighty bless every one of us with paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the love that He has kept. The special love that He has kept for us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.